The New York Times released an investigation into the U.S. drone strike that one Afghan family. We will piece together for the first time his movements in the hours before he was killed. But CNN's investigation raises some serious questions. I am here today to set the record straight and acknowledge our mistakes. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and look at how news is reported. Here are the media stories we're examining this week. Drone warfare, exposed. But why did it take the New York Times and CNN so long to get to such a big story? Russian opposition activists develop a voting app to fight Vladimir Putin in an election, only to be stymied by U.S. big tech. It's a time of reckoning in the Great White North and Canadian Indigenous journalists are leading the way on reporting on the nation's residential school scandal. And South African satirists. We have literally rigged things in your favor. Taking a dig at the fossil fuel industry and its government backers. It was the kind of reporting that gets taught in journalism schools. An investigation by the New York Times that destroyed the Pentagon story about the drone strike in Kabul last month. The U.S. military initially said the strike took out a member of ISIS-K, the group's Afghan offshoot. The Times investigation, and another by CNN, concluded the target was in fact an aid worker, that all 10 of the people killed were civilians, and most of them were children. The Pentagon had to change its story. The Times is reporting the testimonies it heard, the forensic sleuthing it conducted, stands out because we hear so little about America's drone warfare. That's the way the U.S. government wants it. And over the years, with drones penetrating the airspaces of more and more countries, too many American news outlets have complied, neglecting the story, which makes the journalism on this drone attack different and worth examining. Our starting point this week is Kabul. <laughs> September 1st, three days after the drone strike in Kabul kills 10 Afghan civilians, seven of them children, the Pentagon is making no apologies. All of the engagement criteria were being met. At this point, we think that the procedures were correctly followed and it was a righteous strike. 19 days and two journalistic investigations later, different general, different story, effectively rewritten for the Pentagon by the New York Times and CNN. A comprehensive review of all the available footage and reporting on the matter led us to a final conclusion that as many as 10 civilians were killed in the strike, I am here today to set the record straight and acknowledge our mistakes. The two news outlets revealed that the target was no terrorist. What the military apparently didn't know was that Ahmadi was a longtime aid worker. Zamari Ahmadi worked for a U.S.-based NGO trying to end food shortages in Afghanistan. He was a father of seven. The visual reporting here was very crucial uh, to humanize the victims and to show their faces and to show uh, the world that this is how the people look like, the people we thought were terrorists. And for that reason, it also challenged the U.S. narrative effectively. Around 2.30 p.m., Zamorai begins filling water containers to take back home to his family. The U.S. military says around the same time, drone footage showed the driver loading heavy packages with other men into the car. The coverage of a strike like this, where you're seeing people in the moments after something like this has happened, and they're speaking in a way that everybody can understand, this is incredibly valuable. I saw my father lying in the car. There was shrapnel in his chest, throat, everywhere. Blood was flowing through his ears. Not just because it forces the Pentagon to acknowledge something that it rarely acknowledges, but because perhaps it, it forces the millions of people who see those images and hear those voices to put themselves in the position of people who are living under this threat all the time. They decided this was the moment to strike. This was the sort of journalism that we ought to have been providing about every drone strike. Something that is conspicuous primarily by how absent it typically is in mainstream journalism. 
Since 2015, Afghanistan has been hit by an average of more than 2,000 American drone strikes per year, most of which go unreported in the U.S. Why has this one produced so much journalism? Location matters. Most drone strikes take place far from the capital, places hard for journalists to reach, harder still to report from. This one was in the heart of Kabul. There's the context, the American pullout, the chaotic aftermath, the scores of journalists already in the city. Then there's the issuing of the order. It came from the Pentagon and not the CIA. The generals at the DOD, the Department of Defense, have to answer for their drone strikes. The intelligence operatives at the CIA do not. You can't underestimate the difference between DOD and the CIA. If this had been a CIA drone strike, you would still know nothing. And the way in which the Americans have so disastrously conducted the withdrawal, there really is a media frenzy looking to see what are the other myriad mistakes that the Americans have made. It makes it a juicy story. We shouldn't forget that one day before the strike in Kabul took place, we had another drone strike in Nangarhar province in eastern Afghanistan. And uh, unsurprisingly, we didn't hear much about the victims from there. We don't know their stories. The official narrative is that uh, an ISIS planner has been killed by the Americans in Nangarhar. But uh, we should ask ourselves, is this really true? On August 29th, in the hours before... The investigations conducted by the New York Times and CNN, painstaking, graphic, and well-explained, were exceptional, especially given the Times' track record, its reporting on the war on terror. In 2004, the paper had to apologize to its readers for its failings in the run-up to the Iraq war when it dutifully quoted anonymous U.S. intelligence sources on Saddam Hussein's fictional links to Al-Qaeda, the non-existent WMDs. We will find those who did it. We will smoke them out of their holes. The Bush administration launched the drone assassination program in Afghanistan shortly after invading the country in 2001, before expanding it to Pakistan. President Obama upped the number of strikes and targets adding Yemen, Somalia, and Libya to the list, countries the U.S. was not even at war with. The Times did not take issue with that, arguing in a 2013 editorial that drone assassinations were justifiable, as long as capture was impossible. Looking to the U.S. for protection, they instead became some of the last victims in America's longest war. Eight years later, the Times has captured the other side of the story. The question confronting readers of this uh, really exceptional New York Times investigation about the uh, Kabul drone strike is fundamentally one about why it was so exceptional. Uh, American journalism has quite a lot to do in symbiosis with the perpetuation of the war on terror. There's been amazing, probing, vital, powerful journalism in America and abroad exposing the war on terror. But unfortunately, it's the exception, not the rule. I saw this a massive change in the media begin to happen. Around, it happened coincidentally with the 9-11 attacks. Most major news outlets were really struggling to survive as consumers became used to getting their news for free. And so they cut their budget for investigative journalism. This gave rise to what I'm going to just call access reporting. You saw this in the run-up to the American invasion of Iraq. People were never investigating the Bush administration's claims, right? They were simply reporting it. And I would argue that this has really remained the norm. The mainstream media has definitely played a role in normalizing drone warfare. Today in Afghanistan, the U.S. striking back. It has the benefit, supposedly, of sparing the lives of our own troops. That has been a really compelling part of the logic of drone warfare. And encoded in that is a kind of um, hierarchy of the world in which some people's lives are worth more than those of other people.
the American authorities are making it more difficult to report other facts about the drone war. Daniel Hale is a whistleblower who worked for the NSA spy agency from 2011 to 2013, identifying drone targets for assassination. In 2014, following what he called a crisis of conscience, he stole classified documents from the NSA, leading to the biggest journalistic expose of the drone program to date. This past July, Hale was convicted under the Espionage Act and sentenced to 45 months in prison. Daniel Hale's writings from prison show someone from a firsthand perspective with deep knowledge of US drone strikes in places like Pakistan, in places like Yemen. And he gives a real crucial aspect to what this enterprise is and how people from the inside navigate this awful task and in his case draw the conclusion that they can't and that they have to let the public know what successive u.s administrations do and will continue to do according to president joe biden in the public's name President Vladimir Putin and his United Russia party have just won an election that the Kremlin made sure was never in doubt, with a little help from Silicon Valley, USA. Tarek Nafa has been following developments there. Tarek, how did this election unfold and what's the tech angle? Well, with opposition leader Alexei Navalny in jail and his movement outlawed in Russia, his supporters developed a strategy called smart voting which is the use of technology to unify voters behind strong rivals to Kremlin-backed candidates. Now, on the first day of voting, Apple and Google caved to government pressure to remove those apps from their online stores. YouTube also blocked videos that contained voting tips from Navalny's team. What kind of political pressure did those US tech companies face and how are they justifying their actions? Well, both companies are keeping quiet for the time being, but several US news outlets reported that in the case of Google, authorities in Russia singled out company employees based in Russia and said they would face prosecution unless the company complied. Both Apple and Google like to talk the language of free expression and human rights, but ultimately these are business decisions. Neither company wants to lose access to the Russian market or have their revenues affected. Russians have also seen some of their own journalists face new restrictions. What kind of measures are we talking about? Well, until recently, a growing community of alternative news outlets was producing some quality journalism online. As the election approached, most of those outlets and a number of journalists in Russia were labelled foreign agents by authorities in Moscow. These are measures designed to choke off sponsorship and make it harder for journalists to reach both their sources and their readers. OK, thanks, Tarek. Canada has just held a snap election, and voters there have re-elected Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's Liberal Party to a third term albeit with another minority government. One issue that did not get enough play during the campaign, despite making headlines in the months prior, was the disturbing story of mass graves discovered in their thousands at what used to be known as residential schools. Buried there are the remains of indigenous children, students at these re-education centers that dated back to the 1800s, who were left at the mercy of the churches that ran many of the schools. Most Canadians had no idea of what residential schools represented, but the discoveries came as no surprise to Indigenous communities that for decades have tried to get this story out. They were up against governments, churches, and too often, media outlets that just weren't interested. The Listening Post's Ryan Coles now on why it's taken more than a century for the extent of abuse at Canada's residential schools to get the media attention it deserves. 1907, a shocking story makes it to the front pages of Canadian newspapers. Revelations of abhorrent conditions and startling death tolls among Indigenous or First Nations children made to study in residential schools 
colonial institutions created to, quote, assimilate indigenous people while in fact eradicating their culture. The man who uncovered these details? Peter Bryce, the chief medical officer for the Canadian government. It was a national news story. Um, even that wasn't enough to get the government to help the kids. In fact, what the government decided to do was come after Bryce. They push him right out of the public service and they erase him from history. What happened is that the headlines died and that allowed the children to continue to die too. This is a developing story out of British Columbia. The remains of more than 200 children have been located. May 2021, and much of the same information available for all Canadians to read since 1907, this horrific discovery, is rocking the nation to its core. It starts in Western Canada, in the city of Kamloops where an unmarked mass grave of 215 bodies is discovered through the use of ground-penetrating radar. We have breaking news tonight of another terrible finding. Then the dominoes fall. Brandon, Manitoba, Maryville, Saskatchewan, Cranbrook, British Columbia. In total, 1,300 graves, very likely to be the remains of young Indigenous students, are found across the nation. The disclosure of the mass graves and unmarked graves at residential schools across Canada has been explosive this summer because while many Canadians may have known intellectually about what went on at residential schools, I think this year it, ho it hit home viscerally. There has been like a long trajectory of the dialogue of residential schools in Canada. But particularly, I think this pandemic probably had an impact when this story came out. Uh, everyone is thinking about our mortality and it just seems that people are more open to hearing the truth about these things. There are little children outside of these residential schools buried in unmarked graves. It's a, a total crime scene when you have uh, these remains being found and an absolute genocide. The reverberations of this story have not eased months since it broke. In the capital, Ottawa, a memorial for Canada's lost First Nations children is laid out in front of Parliament. Between 1830 and 1996, some 150,000 Indigenous children were coerced to attend these government-funded schools a majority of which were run by the Catholic Church. They were kept in unsafe, unsanitary conditions. Thousands died of disease, and nearly all the students were subjected to intense mental and physical abuse. I don't think it's surprising to any Indigenous person in Canada because we know this history, we've lived this history. Our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents have survived this. What do you want Canadians to know now that you have a chance to, to be heard? I want Canadians to believe us, what we went through in that school. And also not surprising that most Canadians were surprised by it, because I think that we have to think of, of this story in the bigger context of how Indigenous people have been portrayed in media, how our stories have been underrepresented in media and, and often misrepresented. I'd heard the truth from the survivors before. Um, I had been to actually Kamloops Residential School with an elder who told me the stories about the children that were buried in that ground. So it was all there for people to see. The Canadian government knew those children were in the ground. It was an intentional decision to try as much as possible to keep Canadians in the dark about the horrors that were perpetrated by the Canadian state. And that's why people were surprised. Canada's Indigenous population is vastly underrepresented in the country's media. Those who have made it into newsrooms have had to battle bias, institutional racism, and a tendency to dismiss or downplay stories from the community. For many Indigenous journalists, it's been very hard work to get stories about residential schools published. Part of that battle has been a fight over terminology. To convince editors that words like survivors and genocide are appropriate when describing the reality of these schools. Wab Kanu, a journalist turned politician, worked for many years at Canada's national broadcaster, the CBC. It was on some days an uphill battle to try and get the coverage to be accurate for us, us to push, to use the term residential school survivor. But now in 2021, there can be no denying that the term residential school survivor is accurate. 
Some kids went to residential schools and died there. Therefore, the other kids at residential schools survived them, right? And so just in that one battle that we had uh, some 10 years ago, just that little showdown over language, I think shows some of the structural resistance to telling this story accurately. You know, I think that there is an ignorance in this country about the, the truth about our shared history, about how uh, Indigenous people have lived and, and the realities that we faced. And I think that, that those attitudes existed in, you know, the living rooms where we were broadcasting across the country, but also in the newsrooms that were, were, were doing those stories. The reality is there are not enough Indigenous journalists in newsrooms today. And that's now being recognized and there's, you know, efforts to, to change that and to rectify that. Outlets like the Aboriginal People's Television Network, APTN, have been at the vanguard of those efforts. Launched in 1999 with government funding, the outlet says it is dedicated to, quote, telling the unfiltered truth about Indigenous history and current events. Decades before most Canadian newsrooms paid attention to the residential school story, APTN were on it. I can tell you that our current affairs show called Contact one of their very early shows was going to the Shingwak residential school and Chief Mike Kakaji pointing out there are unmarked graves right here that they talked about, that they knew exists when they were kids. Until we recognize and what happened to those children, there were no voices today. And somebody gives them a voice, we can never, never reconcile. They knew that happened. Some kids were even involved, they tell us, uh, in preparing these graves even in some instances. Canadians were really fed an ongoing system of propaganda by governments. We're the best in human rights. Residential schools, that was just a dark chapter, but we've said we're sorry and we're moving forward. Unfortunately, that's wrong. And um, I think that we have editors and newspapers that never stop to look at the facts. But too often they just said, oh, that's too confronting to what my vision of, of Canada is. So no, 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 we're not going to use that word. Without APTN, this would still be a backwater story that no one paid attention to. I'm hearing from residential school survivors that I know well who are saying, finally, the story that I've been talking about is being understood and appreciated by the rest of the country. And we can't undersell how important an organization like APTN has been to that. Because when other folks perhaps either weren't listening or just weren't listening closely enough to the survivors, it was networks like APTN who were there and who were listening to those folks. This story has triggered what seems like a moment of awakening for many Canadians. Both in the public and in the press, there's a momentum around the cause of justice for residential school survivors but also more broadly, an urge to understand Indigenous history better. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Like now that so many Canadians know and so many Canadians care, and so many Canadians are angry that they, they didn't learn the truth. They didn't learn the truth in our education system. They didn't learn the truth in our newspapers or, or, or in our media. And they didn't hear the truth from, from politicians. And, and they're demanding that, that you know we do a better job. And finally, Politically Aware is a South African online news kind of show. That's how its creators describe it. There are a bunch of comedians who produce videos that satirize the news industry and certain newsmakers. Their most recent effort is a collaboration with the Climate Justice Coalition and 350africa.org. It takes aim at South Africa's energy minister, his continuing support for the natural gas industry, despite the climate change implications. How do you know when your satire is hitting home? When the minister's department tweets that the video was not their work and calls it fake news. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post. Are you a fossil fuel company who's sick and tired of being told to feel bad about climate change? Tired of dirty hippies protesting on your street? And boring scientists getting in the way with their annoying facts? The South African Department of Mineral Resources and Energy welcomes you to South Africa. Hi, 
I'm Sylvan Gersi with a message from the South African government. I'm here to tell you about an exciting investment opportunity. South Africa's fossil fuel investment climate is so hot right now. We have literally rigged things in your favor at a huge expense to our citizens, but huge gains for you. We won't let those whiners get in the way with their ancestral grave sites and pff, need for clean water. We've got a three-step plan to make sure you're covered. One, with everyone distracted by the pandemic, we quietly changed the law to strip communities of their rights. Two, we busted people to vote in favor of your company. All those people who have been bust, they were been told to fill their names under our own villages. And three, we lock up human rights lawyers and deploy a minister to the sea. Nelson Mandela said it. It always seems impossible until it's done. Aha!